What's up, everybody? <laughs> Welcome to the beginning of season two on Brew Chatter TV. We got a lot of cool stuff in store. Yep, we're gonna be talking about uh, some hops. We're gonna be talking about a few product reviews. We're gonna be hitting some really neat stuff in there. Maybe we even throw in some uh, wine equipment in there, like presses and destimmers and crushers, and maybe even throw in like a little canning video. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a really fun season too. We got a lot of really cool equipment to mess with. You yep. know, some of the stuff I don't even know how to use. So we'll be learning together as we do this. Yeah, that's the best part. Yeah. <laughs> well, today. We're gonna start everything off with West Coast IPAs because this this is a beer that is always close to my heart. I'm a total hophead, and there are things that you can do to make your West Coast IPA the best that it could possibly be. So that's what we're talking about today. Yeah, West Coast IPA. It's like, it's one of those beers I really enjoy drinking. You know, it's a little dry, you know, and it finishes with very good hop flavors and really good hop aromas as a warm up. So, and it's really my, sort of my go-to beer, I guess, you know. Um, it's not my preferred style. I really honestly don't have a preferred style. I drink all of them when they're cold with alcohol. Yep. But uh <laughs> so you got a beer, I'm into it. <laughs> I know, right? But the West Coast IPA is pretty pretty good though. It's like my go-to. Like if I'm at the um, convenience store, liquor store, or a friend's house or something and I'm going through his cooler and he just so happens to have a West Coast style IPA, I'll typically go for it, you know? So yep. it's like really good finish, good, and I can typically drink it all day if it's about seven percent. Absolutely. But I practice a little bit, so don't do that at home. Yeah, that's part of it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, tell us a little bit, what's the history of this IPA a little bit? So, the whole West Coast IPA, double IPA thing, I, I, I think Sierra Nevada started paving the way with the pale ale, that super bitter, bitter forward kind of profile. You know, Stone was right behind them with Stone's IPA and that real aggressive bitter. But I, I think when it comes to West Coast and double West Coast IPA, Pliny kind of started the whole thing. Yeah, Pliny the Elder, very good beer. Very good beer, crazy dry, a lot of good hop bitterness, but also a lot of hop complexity, big aromas, big turp profile. Yeah, and then you have other breweries out there like Jamil's Brewer Brewery, Heretic, oh, yeah. with Evil Th I think I got a bottle here, hold on. Just bring the small bottle. That's the one. So, Jamil was very kind enough <laughs> to send us over his uh, Evil 3 from his release party that was, what, like a week ago? So, but he's not far from here. He's like, what, three hours away? Yeah, right over the hill. Yeah, but number 42, so we definitely <laughs> <laughs> gotta give shout out to Jamil and tell him thanks for this bottle. Yeah. But this is a triple IPA. Triple, double. <laughs> Same sort of concept though. <laughs> Super dry, this just happens to be huge alcohol but super dry, big hop bitterness, huge flavor yeah. profile and terp extraction. And, and that's that's what you're going for. Yeah, 11 and a half triple IPA. Nice and light. Yeah, nice and light. There's only like, what, six beers in here? Yeah, something like that. It's it's like three quarters of a gallon. Yeah, so I could totally do that on my own. Yeah, well. If I wasn't going anywhere and there was a barbecue going. <laughs> oh yeah. No problem. Yeah, but it's much better to share, especially when you have a beer this good. Absolutely. And a beer this good, you definitely want to share. Yeah. A lot of great West Coast IPAs out here. Absolutely. But anyway, I had to get the Evil 3 in the show. Yeah, gotta, gotta give some love to Heretic. Yes. All right, so when you're making a West Coast IPA, uh, you know, start with malt. Yeah, I would start, let's just build the profile of like, when you're in the store building that West Coast IPA, you already got the idea that you want this very um, crisp beer, you know, and you want really good hot flavors, hot bitterness and hop aromas, you want it to be balanced out, not too much one direction, you know, but sometimes some of these commercial examples are a little bit more one direction and they're still good, So and that's okay too. You're the you're the home brewer, so really you can do it however you please. And that's the yeah. best part. But yeah, starting with the grain bill, you know, like Golden Promise is a great base, you know, it gives you that little orangey tint in it, or you can go with like a Pilsner malt, or and you can even throw in a little bit of wheat in there, which like I would keep around 5% though. Exactly. But it helps with a little bit of um, head retention, you get a little proteins, you know. Exactly. Really, really good. Sometimes you can throw a little crystal in there, but the with me, the secret on the grain bill the simpler, the better. Yes. So even if you're just doing a single malt or a smash IPA or something like that, like just a, your base and then maybe a little bit, especially like Victory or Biscuit or even like a tiny bit of Crystal, you know, would be a great, fantastic base for a West Coast IPA. And keep keep your Crystal to somewhere between two and a half and 5%. I mean, like you said, you wanna keep that grain bill as simple as possible. And and because you're, you're building hops, you're not really building grain. 
you just you got the grains in there for the sugar yeah. you know and uh, like uh, I think it was Vinny was giving out um advice about his plenty of the elder which is he publicizes that recipe all the time and it's always slightly different as and stuff like that but uh, one of the things that stuck with me when he was talking about it in one of his articles that I was reading was he said don't over crystallize you know you don't want to over crystallize your IPA so it's okay to even sometimes keep that out or just put a little bit like crystal tin or maybe a little crystal 40 yep. you know but you don't need a lot of it it's like if you're doing five gallons like a half pound is more than sufficient Absolutely. But yeah, moving into what would we do next? So we got our base and your grains. You got gold promise. We got to talk about sugar. That's a huge thing. So there's more sugar than what I'm getting out of the grain we're putting in there. Absolutely. Oh. So add up to up to 10% dextrose, and that's going to give you a perception of dryness. It's going to help dry the whole thing out. Um, not everybody uses that much. I, um, I think Pliny does do 10% dextrose. I can't. Remember. I can't remember, but. You can do that, that 10% super easy to ferment, simple sugar, and that gives you a perception of dryness on the back end. And that helps push your bitterness out, that helps push, push your turk profile out, which is beautiful. Yes, definitely. Sugar. Sugar. And when it comes More to sugar. hops. Yeah, there's a few different ways you can do hops. A few different ways, and, and what we usually stick with is a solid bitter balance addition. You can do 90 minutes, you can do, if you're doing a, a Pilsner base. Um, you can do 60 minutes, but somewhere in there, and this hop extract stuff is killer for that. It's it's about 10 IBUs per mil per five gallons. So if you just want to do an easy bitter balance addition, throw however many IBUs you're trying to put in there on your mash paddle, mix it in, done. You don't have to hop again until Whirlpool. Yeah, and then there was like another one in there that argued it, but like first ward edition, hopping your mash. It's like, there's all kinds of these other things that you'll read about and stuff like and honestly you should try all of them yes. if you're in the west coast you know try hopping your mash which is fun you know it's like i don't typically do that much anymore it's like i used to do it a little bit but i was just like well it almost feels like i'm getting the same results if i just do a 60 minute edition and then just like hammer that thing with hops you know uh right at the end of the boil you know and another exactly. thing that Vinny says in a lot i read some of his stuff on ipas but he's like, if you're just standing there, you should be throwing hops in the boil. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, that's like the I like coolest that. thing ever. <laughs> but um, but yeah, and uh, I don't even know where I was going with that. But uh, you should be throwing <laughs> hops in the boil because yes. I can't figure out what I'm doing. More hops is the key. <laughs> yes, but yeah, first wort is our first wort addition. So that's like when you're um, sparging, transferring into your brew kettle, you throw your hops in, and then you have that just running over the hops as you're filling your kettle. So that's your first wort addition. And you'll see that in some of these big IPA recipes, you'll see first wort and hop mash and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, we, RJ and I, we've done pretty much all of those methods, and we've we've pretty much I think we can agree that like 60 minutes or even 90 minute boils sometimes if we're doing like a Pilsner base for that IPA, it's like you'll still get a, the same bittering out of it, you know. And we didn't see too big a difference. Yeah, but, and with with the for, first wort stuff, the the theory is that you're gonna get a smoother hop profile or a, a smoother bitter profile. But really, if your IBUs are on point and that first edition is on point, you're using hops with low cohumulin levels, you know, magnum, even even citra, although we don't bitter with citra because... It's a better hop used at the end. Yeah, exactly. Know. But, I mean, look for those low cohumulin levels and that'll give you that smooth bitterness so you don't have to have the extra process of first word hopping. But like like Josh said, you should you should try it because it's fun and see if you notice a difference. Let us know. Yeah, and experiment around with a few different hop variations and stuff like that. But pelletized hops, whole cone hops, you know, I pretty much stick around pelletized hops. You know, whole cone hops is good, but you got a lot of brat and leaves and stuff like that oh. that gets in there. But you can make a really fantastic IPA with whole cone hops as well. That's sure. just for my personal preference. I enjoy the pellets. And even um, the, these new hops, they, well, not necessarily new hops, but more readily available to homebrewers are cryo hops. Those things work really well. It's like it has all the lupulin, you know, you don't have any of the brat, none of the leaves, so you don't have to worry about any kind of grassy or green flavors or anything weird like that from yeah. uh, over hop, or not over hopping, but hopping too long. Yes. You know, so. Cryo hops, you should definitely use cryo for all of your late additions, all of your dry hopping, because they're magic. They're Even hopping in the keg. Hopping in the keg, and the, the hop profile lasts longer for whatever reason, it's part of the process, I guess, but the, the terps stay in the beer longer, so. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Flavor. So 
Flame Out Whirlpool Editions. Um, if, yeah. if this is the most confusing part. So if you're not sure what Whirlpool Edition is. Yes. Very, we're we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it a lot. <laughs> as soon as one of us talks about it. <laughs> so I'll drink. A lot of recipes, you'll see Flame Out, you'll see Whirlpool. Depending on your system, depending on your capabilities, if you want the max extraction from that Flame Out Edition, Cool your wart down to 180. Between 180 and 160 is where you get that that huge terp extraction, that that huge flavor. So you'll get the most out of your late edition hops by doing it there. Now, if you can't do that flame out edition, you're still doing something very similar, and and you'll go through those those heat points as you're cooling, but you get max extraction if you can get it between 160 and 180. And we usually we'll we'll set the uh, the robo brew when we're brewing five gallon batches. We'll set it to 170, cool it down to 180, throw them in, turn the pump on, get everything moving through those hops and then let it sit there for like 20 minutes. Yeah. And we we almost get as much turf extraction and flavor and aroma extraction from doing that as we do from dry hopping. Yeah, and remember, flame out additions, your wort is still hot, so you're still getting ideas yeah. as you're chilling you're still going to isomerize those alpha acids. So you're going to you're not going to get a ton not of IBUs, but, but yeah. you're still getting bitterness. Yeah, so just remember don't think that just 0 minutes you just got them boiling that it's not going to add any kind of bittering. It's like it's going to be less, a lot less. Exactly. But it's still going in there. Yep. You know, still bitter. Something you have to keep That's in why mind for your response. Yeah. yeah. And we'll try it. You will love it. It makes such a huge difference versus just a flame out hop you you'll notice yeah. the difference you you'll notice the smell yeah you don't necessarily need like a whirlpool port either i mean you yeah. can sit there and just chill it do you know with the your sanitized paddle you know if you're that cold but uh but sit there and swirl it and just have your hop sitting in there get it down to that temp you know temperature is very important at this point so if you can get that temp there you're good to go in in theory if you're using an immersion chiller you're already it's already in solution so it's it's pretty easy to just turn the water on for a minute yeah, and turn chill. it back off and yeah, let them get those there. hops in there. Yeah, a lot of with a lot of our IPA recipes, what we find ourselves doing is is building the hop profile for the whirlpool, and then we mirror that for the dry hop. So yeah. and dry hops almost invariably go in on day nine. We dry hop for three to five days, crash chill, get it in the keg. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, but we've and, had a. Yeah, well, when you said dry hop, I just want to make sure we just sprinkle them on the top of the wort. We don't do bags or any of this other stuff or anything. It's like very simple. We get a lot of questions in the store. It's like, well, yeah. am I going to infect my beer? And it's like, no. It's like your antimicrobial. It's like you don't want to be sneezing in the wort. Like, <laughs> like that'd be horrible. You know, it's like you open that up and but you open it up a little bit. Be very careful and just sort of you know get your hops in there, and they'll they'll absorb that wort, sink in, and you know you'll start working. Yeah, you, you don't know. have to stir them in or anything. No. You just throw them right on top and they'll do the rest yeah they'll do the rest you know and usually and not always to be fair i mean we've we've had a few beers with half a pound of dry hops in them but for the most part when you crash chill as the yeast fall out a lot of the hops fall out as well so you don't have to worry too much about clarity clarity and gunk and stuff you just have to be careful when you rack you just have to have a good process yeah. with going in the keg if you have a good process going in keg and crash chilling you know all that stuff it's like you're gonna have a fairly clear beer yep. you know if uh, you're having a lot of issues with clarity, you know, there, maybe look at your process and how you're adding your hops, you know, maybe too much dextrin or wheat malt, you know what I mean? Too many proteins of solution and stuff like that. Yep. Because those just don't drop out. Exactly. But, uh, yeah. yeah. There's, there are other tools. If you're, if you're super worried about clarity, there are other tools at your disposal. I mean, if, if the crash chill isn't enough, then you can throw gelatin in during the crash chill. And that'll help everything. It's like whirl flock, but on the cold side. It'll help everything stick together and get heavy and fall to the bottom. Or just get it cold. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Got to have it cold with or without gelatin. That's that's a huge part of the process, and it, it helps a lot. Yeah. Uh, another thing you can do is clarity firm. I mean, that stuff's yeah, clarity firm, super clear. I mean, they got a bunch of them out yeah. there. You know, you just got to sort of find the one you enjoy using. You know, Isinglass. They have all kinds yeah. of stuff. You know, but uh, like really. All we do is crash chill. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> like we don't get too scientific with this yeah. clarity stuff, you know. Um, we just sit there, crash chill, you know. It's just like running glycol through the jagged fermenter at your pro brewery. You know, they're doing the same thing. Yep, exactly. You know. And then, so getting into yeast profiles for your West Coast IPAs, you know, like 001, California L, be a great selection for this. 
you know, if in 007, uh, Dry English Ale would yep. be a very good selection too. Uh, Stone, I think that's Stone Strain, right? I think so. And then uh, Cal L is Sierra Nevada, I think. Yep. And um, that one, and then you got Imperials, you know, Flagship would be a good one for this one. Yep. Imperial has a good handful of uh, different types of hops, uh, like juice and citrus and dry hop. The dry hop is a blend, which is really cool, really yeah. fun, something to toy around with. And then you got Y East in there. 1056 is really good. And then they got a few, uh, Den uh, Denny's favorite, uh, was yeah, it 1450? 1450. Yeah, That's it was a really good one. strain as well. And, um, but yeah, I think the they even got West Coast IPA strain and Y East. I think so, one of their special release ones. Yeah, it's a uh, seasonal, yeah. very good strain too. And, and the, the key is use something that's a big fermenter, like the, the Chico strain is- High flock. High flock. High attenuation. High attenuation. I, I think the, the Chico strain is 80 plus. So, I mean, it's gonna ferment everything. Yeah. And mixed with your low mash temp, um, with these, and we didn't cover that in the malt part, but. I always should have did that. Yeah. We screwed that up. Yeah, we got it. I don't know if I want to, well, we should talk about it. Yeah, let's, let's circle back around. <laughs> Two seconds. So, <laughs> beep. Uh, mash temp, keep it low, keep it, uh, 147 is when beta amylase is going to do the most work. That's the, the optimum temp for that enzyme. But 147, 149, we usually do 149. Yeah, you just hang around there, you know, yeah. plus or minus a couple degrees. It's like even 152, you'll know, be just fine. Yeah. You know, and uh, it'll be a really good beer. When you start getting above that, it's like, mm, probably not really the best place to be. Yeah, you're starting to make not, longer chain sugars. Not for West. It? Yeah, your sugar chain is a little longer, stuff like that. Yeast are going to have trouble yeah. consuming that. That's that's hazy territory. We'll cover that. Yeah, that's another, another, video. another video, but definitely something to consider. But yeah, yeah mash temps, like 149, 152, the highest. Right around there. Yep. Perfect. For our flavor profile. Yeah. But anyway, we got a full write-up on the brew cranium that RJ wrote about uh, West Coast. So a lot of stuff we talked about in this video we have in that blog, or RJ wrote in that blog with links and stuff like that around the website, uh, talking about the different types of grains we use and the percentages, and then talking a little more about crystals. And um, exactly. yeah, RJ had a pretty good write-up on that with some really good photos and stuff like that. But yeah, be sure to check out the Brew Cranium Brew Blog. Absolutely, a little bit more science-y. There's another, if you want to get a little bit more into terps and hop oils and stuff, there's another blog on Brew Cranium about all of that. It kind of helps you understand what you're working with and you know optimal extraction, stuff yeah. like that. Is so. that the one with the photo with the hop hash looking stuff? Yeah, yeah. Super that cool. stuff is so yeah, cool. Yeah, you see something that looks like a green blob, you know, like putty? Yeah, you definitely gotta check that out. Yeah, it's that like, like resin. It's so fun. Yeah. It sticks to your hands for days. <laughs> I, know. I know, it makes it yeah. but Anyway, thanks for watching. We appreciate it. Hopefully this helped you out, figure out a little bit about your West Coast IPA. And hopefully we shed a little bit of light if you had a few questions. If you have more questions and we didn't cover them in the video, be sure to write them down in the comments, uh, send it through. And uh, we're planning on doing like a, a questions video probably towards the end of the season where we have all of your questions and we come in and we just RJ and I will sit down and we'll just answer our or your guys' questions the best we can. And just we just want to share all the information and things that we've learned. You know? yeah, and that's what it's about. Yeah. Brew on. Brew on. <laughs> <laughs> we need to work on that ending. I don't know I, what the, I, I, just I, had, I had something else I was going to say, and then it totally just went out of my head. I know. So like, still uh, yeah, beer. I think we should drink this beer. We're it's going only to. like 8.30. We should start now. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to need all day to drink it. <laughs>